Well, I'm Robert Wolanski, the Communications Director here at Heritage Auctions, and I'm joined by Craig Kissick, our Director of our Nature and Science category. And we're going to discuss the state of the nature and science market uh, for the next hour. We'll also look forward to the upcoming auction that takes place on Friday at 7 p.m. But Craig, while we're letting folks uh, file in here real quick, I have a very quick question for you. It's actually okay. a quick question. It may, may necessitate a longer answer than we may have time here for. But I'm just curious. You know, this is not you. You have, I believe, another title in addition to director of uh, nature and science, correct? I do. Yeah, I'm, I am currently the president of the AAPS, which stands for the Association of Applied Paleontological Sciences. It's basically a, a group that keeps current on legislation, but essentially oversees the people who deal in fossils from a commercial dealership standpoint. So I'd say if you go to a major gem mineral and fossil show, we're kind of the group that that is made up of most of the people who are there selling dinosaur bones and the various wares like that. So it keeps me really in the middle of the heartbeat of the business. And it's a it's a pretty small community. So it's very important to to, to know everybody and be part of that sort of highly dysfunctional family. <laughs> well, aren't all families? Yeah, a little bit. Well, I, I ask you that, and I find that to be fascinating because for the nature of this discussion that we're about to have, um, you know, certainly everybody brings their perspective uh, in each respective category to the discussion of what is the state of their particular market and their particular category. But you really have a really broad based knowledge of it in as much as that you have discussions with your colleagues uh, across the country about kind of what's happening and what impacts there may be on the market because of, as you say, legislation or other things that are upcoming. Right. So, look, let's start there. Here, uh, here we are exactly a year out, pretty much, from uh, when we were all sent home at Heritage, uh, mm -hmm. when the world changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm curious what the last year has been like for you and, and, and how you handled it a year ago and, and how your colleagues thought of it a year ago. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's been a challenge and our business has always had, as you said before, the, the legislative challenges. We're always watching about, you know, things being legal, you know, illegal now that were legal before, those kind of changes like that. So it becomes very important to, to keep up on it. And the COVID pandemic certainly has been very problematic. A lot of the people in this industry make their living going to trade shows. These gem mineral and fossil shows are a major source of their income. It's a way that we often you know, get some material for our auctions and things. We participate very aggressively in those shows. I've been going to them for almost 30 years now. And uh, it's, a, you know, it's a wonderful experience. It's a great time, but it's been a real challenge in our industry. And But I do think that's why places like Heritage have seen some pretty consistent success over the past year, because with our internet platform, it's allowed people who are stuck at home to participate and still sort of, um, you know, exercise their little demons in terms of wanting to collect things and learn about things and deal with stuff and give them a real way to interact with this business that has been put on hold, but it certainly hasn't disappeared. So let's uh, look, let's, uh, and I want to make sure that everybody knows reason Craig is here. And it's always wonderful when we have our experts in house uh, to discuss things on zoom, please drop a question for Greg, for Craig in the Q and a uh, I'm happy to, uh, to relay them to Craig. Um, I don't assume you have any for me, but if you do, I'm, I'm certainly a uh, game as well. <laughs> awesome. But the fact is, uh, obviously, we have a sale upcoming, and the we sale do. is uh, going to take place on the 19th. It takes place at 7 p.m. Central. Uh, here are some of the wonderful featured items, the most popular, the most active. And Craig and I will discuss uh, them in a little bit, and we'll discuss them throughout uh, in terms of how they relate to sales from last year. But the fact is, you know, so we begin, this was exactly one year ago, right? March it, it was, uh, yeah, March 14th of, of 2020. So March 11th, I'll never forget, was the day that the NBA shut down, the day that Tom Hanks is uh, diagnosed, and the day that the world kind of wonders what will happen next. Three days later, we have an auction involving <laughs> a lot of crystallized gold, as you see here, which sold for $156,250. Uh, I assume uh, on the day that this auction opened, you probably had no idea what in the wide, wide world of paleontology to expect. Well, I will certainly say that I probably did not have a very good night of sleep in anticipation of that auction. I was very concerned about what was going on. It, um, no, no credit to myself, but it did seem to be quite fortuitous that we had such a wonderful selection of gold because gold, of course, is a universal commodity, especially something that people go to and in more trying times. So 
we were very successful on that sale. And, you know, we, we had some pretty, uh, I won't call it record setting, but we got some very, very, um, very attractive prices realized for some of the higher profile offerings in that sale. So obviously that sold well. Uh, there was the gold nugget from Australia that was also in that auction. And I believe that they had this other gold nugget for Australia. Mm-hmm. Certainly, you know, gold was going to do well, probably regardless, right? Because of, you know, the fact that in the middle of financial and economic uncertainty, what better investment than gold nuggets? Well, I mean, gold has really been the the kind of the universal commodity for, you know, going back throughout history and people still go to it today. Um, one interesting aspect of, of our auctions is that we kind of have two two different worlds. Gold nuggets are, of course, you know, in nugget form, they typically tend to have a valuation relative to weight in some sort of abstract, abstract. But when you're talking about the crystallized pieces, those are specimen grade pieces that are going to hardcore mineral collectors. Those are people who are collecting it because of the crystallized form, the beauty, the aesthetic, possibly the locality, the mine it's from, whatnot, not necessarily the actual weight or gold content of the piece. So a crystallized gold you know, piece might only have five ounces of gold in it, but might be worth a hundred thousand dollars. Whereas a gold nugget is typically kind of based on, you know, the actual mass. But one interesting thing to think about, and there's a lot of really um, arguable adages to go in here. A one ounce gold nugget is as rare as a five carat diamond in terms of of the amount that there is. And 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 I'll, I'll, I'll say this wrong, but it's something I'd encourage all of our, our viewer friends to kind of research. There's a, there's a standard that all of the gold that's ever been mined would fit in a cube that's 20 by 20 by 20 meters. I mean, it's really not a whole, it's basically a giant room. And you further take that thought that about 98% of all gold that's ever been mined has been refined for purposes. So the fact that any gold that actually even remains in a crystallized or nugget form is inherently very, very rare. And I'm not sure people really understand that. I mean, gold is there, there's a reason it's kind of the top precious metal in terms of a collectible commodity. There is a reason for it. So as, as the year, as, as that week was unfolding, you know, were you talking to folks about what they were going to be buying, what their collecting habits might be, uh, as the pandemic began and as, you know, sort of there was the uncertainty about what might be collectible now and what might have changed over the course of even the week preceding that particular auction? Well, you know, Robert, one of the funniest things for us is that nat- natural history people tend to um, really like to participate the day of the auction. We don't always, and as compared to other categories here at Heritage, we don't often see people bidding as much ahead of time. So candidly, we don't often know exactly what's going to sell or how it's going to sell until it actually happens. So it was really a bit of a crapshoot in this one to kind of know what was going to happen. And as I said, you're right about the 11th, but I mean, that 14th, that Saturday, for example, here in Dallas, as you well know, they have a, a giant St. Patrick's Day event that's almost one of the most important events of the year here, and that was canceled. So that that everybody just kind of stopped down that day, and that was a Saturday you know, before St. Patrick's Day, unlike any that had been in previous decades here. For folks who don't know, for folks who aren't in Dallas, that's actually the parade. <laughs> uh, that's Dallas's biggest annual event is probably its St. Patrick's Day parade, yep. which was saved two years ago by Dallas Mavericks owner and Shark Tank host Mark Cuban. So when Cuban, who had been obviously the face of the pandemic, when the Mavericks uh, – he was at the game when he learned that the right. NBA season was closing down. So, yeah, that was a bit of a seismic shift here. But, you know, Craig, I want to back up to something you said a moment ago, which is that unlike many of the other categories here, I see your room I like just to... went dark. Your room just went dark. Oh, well, all in the name of conservation. So we're good. <laughs> That's fine by me. I'm often in the dark and alone. Um I want to back up to something you said a moment ago, which I find fascinating. And I think people who are on this call might be interested in as well, which is that, as you said, obviously in many of the categories here, a lot of folks bid in sports. They have to bid to get in on the extended bidding. Um, When it comes to comic books, video games, and other things, there is a lot of advanced bidding because people are really, you know, jostling for a lot of these pieces. Why is it that in nature and science, 
that a lot of folks keep their cards close to their vest until the day of the auction? Well, candidly, Robert, that's been a mystery that I've been trying to solve for the almost 10 years that I've been here. I really don't know that I have the right answer. One, one interesting corollary to that is that other than the commoditized nature of the metals, which we just mentioned, talking about the gold, and you're showing us a beautiful, exquisite platinum nugget, which is also extremely rare. And that was a very aesthetic, very good sized example that we sold um, as well in that same auction. Is it ba basically you have the fact that we are very much not a commodity type deal. In some other categories, it's pretty, it's pretty tangible what something sold for, what something should sell for. There's a lot more of a sort of a repetitive process here by the very nature that every piece I offer is so singular and so unique that it's really hard to track it in that kind of manner. That's really what makes it so interesting, but also so challenging. I mean, any particular mineral fossil meteorite is inherently not like any other mineral fossil or meteorite. So you really can't apply that same thing to it. And I think as a result, because people don't know how something's supposed to do or don't have an expectation of what it's going to do, they wait until the auction and they want to actually see how does it come out of the gate? What has it been up to, bid up to, and then they want to play. And a lot of times, unlike some other categories too, we'll have the community here. We'll have an auction of fine minerals and the mineral collecting community is in the room. And that creates a great deal of energy. I mean, as, as great as Heritage's platform is, and as much as we're all very happy at the success of the online, nothing beats the energy of a live auction in the room. Oh, absolutely. You know, I'm fascinated as well by the fact that, you know, here, we're going to look at the meteorites here yep. in a moment yep. as well. I'm fascinated, yep. uh, and this is a, a subject that comes up quite frequently. And again, if you have a question for Craig, feel free to drop it in the Q&A. Uh, but this is a question that's often asked throughout this course of the state of the market commentaries that we've been doing, these discussions, which is that the estimate, when yep. you are dealing with something that is so foreign, as it were, like a mm -hmm. meteorite, uh, whether it's a lunar meteorite or a Martian meteorite, yep. Certainly, there is a very little uh, sort of, you know, how do you begin to even contemplate where to set the estimates, uh, given the fact that these are, um, it's not like you can go into the, the <laughs> CGC or the PSA reports and look at uh, how many populations there are and what the previous uh, POP 10 saw, the previous Gem Mint 10 in this uh, particular iteration sold for. Right. Well, no, no, you can't. And I'm going to, I'm going to throw in a couple, if I can, at, at times, I'd like to take the opportunity to kind of throw in a, a mind vitamin as our, uh, as our local celebrity friend, Razor Ray of Dallas stars fame would say. Um, one thing I want to clarify to people who don't know, and I think it's a very important thing is a lot of people will, will talk about a moon rock. Okay. And, and, and these are lunar meteorites, which is consubstantial the same, but I do want to make an important clarification. Any rock that was collected from the lunar surface by an astronaut is not available to be owned privately and is deemed to be the property of the U.S. government and NASA. So when we talk about this, this is a, this is a moon rock. This is exactly the same kind of material that the Apollo astronauts collected, but this was not collected by an astronaut. There was a, if you will, a piece of space junk. There might have been an asteroid something impacts the surface of the moon, creates an incredible compression of that surface. And you can see the conglomerate nature of this breccia with various components put together, much like a sedimentary rock is formed. And then there is enough energy to expel certain pieces that actually get out of the gravitational pull of that celestial body and ultimately can make it down to earth as a meteorite. So this is basically something hit the lunar surface and jettisoned this off, and this made it down to Earth. Now, this is a beautiful end-cut specimen. So you can see the great duality of the, of the very planetary exterior with the beautiful cut interior that shows you the composition inside with the beautiful white clasps in, in perfect contrast against the charcoal gray background color. It's really pretty amazing. Now, there is a cacophony of lunar meteorites. There's all kinds of different ones, and based on their rarity, typically related to what we call the TKW or the total known weight. If you look up the Meteoritical Bulletin, which is kind of the 
the biblical encyclopedia of this kind of information. You could look up any given lunar and you could see how much there is and what the main mass or the largest extant piece is. So this is an extremely large, but also extremely beautiful end cut. And lunars can, can range in value you know, by, by the gram all over the place. So you basically have to start with the particular variety of that particular lunar, see what other examples have sold for, make adjustments for the aesthetic and the premium that might go with it, then your valuation grows from there. Well, see, I'm fascinated. This one sold for 218,000. Yep. Uh, the Martian meteorite goes for one, sold for 162,000. Yep. Uh, and I, I'm fascinated just sort of by where the values are and sort of how those values come about. Yep. Uh, is it because of the rarity? Is it because of the size? Is it because of the fact that whoever bought these particular pieces, including this uh, meteorite as well, yep. um, is it because they love the way they look? Is it because of the rarity of it, the, the way of uh, where it landed? Um, I assume any number of factors impact its value. Well, if we go backwards, it's a perfect starting point segue. The piece you're showing right now is, is a Gibeon meteorite. And a Gibeon is one of the classic sculptural irons that's ever existed in the world. It fell in Namibia. Now, now there, there are three aspects of, of a meteorite's sort of dating, if you will. There's the component age of the actual material, which in many cases can go back billions of years to the origin of the solar system. There's the fall date when it's anticipated that the rock actually impacted the earth. And then there's the fine date when actually pieces were first discovered. In the case of Gibeon, it's very fascinating because, you know, this is an extremely old, you know, piece of space metal. And it probably fell, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. And then it was first collected in probably, I think we have a record of, a, of an English captain finding it in 1536. But the Nama people used it in tools and things well before that. And we just really don't have proper recorded history of that. But to really stay sharp and get to where you asked, this particular stuff, Gibeon has a, has a monstrously large strewn field, which means the area in which pieces of this meteorite are found. This piece is beautiful because it's sculptural, it's stable, it's not rusting, it's got these beautiful thumbprint uh, craters, which we called regmaglyphs in the in the trade, and that is an extremely sculpturally beautiful meteorite. So even though you might say, okay, Gibeon sells for X amount, a gram or a pound or whatever, this particular piece is a very collectible, very sculptural specimen, and it's also large enough to be significant. So it really gives you the best of both worlds. So sometimes it is a meteorite where it was found. But all of these factors, Robert, go in, the aesthetics, the size, um, any combination, just like with the lunars. I mean, if there's a small amount of lunar of a given one, it's going to be higher value. This Martian is exquisite. You've got the fusion crust, which is kind of the skin of the meteorite, which is very important to collectors. And you really don't get a gist of it from this front side showing sort of the orientation. But the backside of that meteorite has a little reddish hue to it. And I always find it fascinating that Mars is nicknamed the red planet. So it's only fitting that a meteorite from there would have a little bit of a kind of a red color. So, you know, it just, you just can't, the, the fascination's endless. I mean, I could talk about any of this forever and this is not me being a professional for heritage. This is me being just somebody who's so enthusiastic about natural history. I can't, you know, I, I want to go run out and grab one of them right now and play with it. I just can't. <laughs> Leslie asks in the Q and A, are the cubes that are displayed in the photos meant to represent an inch? Uh, yeah, it's it's a little brass ingot that is a one inch scale bar, and the little slash in it is a centimeter. So it was actually custom made for us for smaller things. We've been asked. It's 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 actually a funny story. We've had people who have been shipped an item and they were angry that they didn't receive that with it. They kind of thought it came with a lot. We've had other people that have asked about it. it it's gotten all kinds. It's been a, been a really big mystery. We probably need to do something a little better. You'll see in other meteorite photos, there's a little die, and it has little different things on it that other meteorite dealers were used. This is just unique to us, so it's our little brass measurement. But, yes, Leslie, that does represent one inch, and that's designed to really show other than very, very large specimens where sometimes we use – human models to really give you an idea. Scale is critical. And what Robert said about valuations that people will all the time, they'll call me about something and I'm like, well, 
I can say nothing until you send me an image. But if you send me an image, an image without scale or dimensions is useless. You can't, you really can't get your head around. You just look at this picture that's up right now. You would have no idea if that was the size of a pea or the size of a basketball. So you've got to have something to put it in relative terms. And that really also helps us to manage the valuation question. So we've looked obviously at uh, sales in the last year in terms of meteorites. There's 218,000 for this, for this uh, lunar meteorite, 162 for the Martian meteorite. Yep. Yep. And for the Gibeon 28. Yep. Um, so obviously in this particular auction that we have coming up on at 7 p.m. on Friday, uh, here's this Martian meteorite. And obviously, as we see, it's not an enormous piece, but it's an incredibly valuable piece. Yes. So, yes. so talk to me about if, if, if I were to consider buying this, uh, this Martian meteorite or the Martian meteorite here as well. Yep. Yep. You know, what makes these so significant? Okay. Well, these are, these are two, I mean, I mean, the, the, the stories I'm going to, I'm going to get go nuts here because the stories are really phenomenal. This particular dark piece is, is the variety of a meteorite called a Chassignite. And that is relative to a fall that occurred, I believe in 1815 in Chassigny, France. And this is really um, uh, the most important Chassignite that's fallen since. I think this, this occurred back in about the year 2000. Now, this particular specimen is actually nicknamed Diderot after the French philosopher. So it's even got a super cool nickname. And you can see this is a kind of, you know, a very dark type specimen, but it's a very important because not only is it an extremely rare chassignite, it's the main mass or what that means is the largest piece of the total known weight that, that exists. So, I mean, this, this is a kind of piece that again, I. I don't mean to be cavalier, but I mean, this piece is, this piece appears on the NASA website in a photograph. Uh, this is a piece that institutions and museums do not have. This is one of the most important Martian meteorites that can be owned privately, period. So to me, the, the sheer fascination of the, of the bullet point facts, if you will, to me, it's priceless. I mean, I don't even know how, you, you, you said something like that. And I will say that although absolute numbers for, as you said, Robert, something that's about this big that we're talking about a six figure deal is still relative to the value of what this represents per gram. I'd argue it's a steal. I mean, it's actually very, very conservatively valued. And the starting bid on this piece and the next one that we're about to discuss are, 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 are amazing opportunities. Maybe two of the actual best deals to, to use that word in the entire auction. So, Craig, let me ask you this. I'm fascinated by um, the collector of such a piece. As you say, the, I assume yep. space collectors. But has the nature of the collector in your category changed in the last year in as much as that perhaps once upon a time it was museum uh, folks at museums or, or folks who studied space. But I also assume that uh, in the era of you're not sure what to invest in or uh, sort of in which direction the economy goes at any given moment, that owning one of the rarest and most significant Martian meteorites uh, may in fact be uh, just one of those things it's difficult not to invest in. Well, I think, Robert, I mean, that's a great segue, and I appreciate that. I mean, first of all, and this is not a flippant answer, just the, the quip is that this is something that truly is out of the world, out of this world. I mean, you really, you're, you know, you, I mean, how we're, we're talking about a piece of the planet Mars. I mean, how you almost don't even have to say anything after that. I mean, get your head around what we're talking about here. I mean, this is this is an amazing thing. I think the collectors have I have seen strong sales internationally of meteorites over the last year. I think the serious collectors have, have ramped up, and I think more and more people are coming to the hobby. Again, you don't have to collect meteorites or even necessarily be a natural history enthusiast or a scientific-minded person to be overwhelmed by how amazing this is. That's the greatness of this, that the universal appeal of this, of something, by the way, from the universe is just unbelievable. Now, this particular piece, this is, this is nicknamed Jules Verne, an homage to the artist's work called the, uh, the Chase for the Golden Meteor. It's actually considered the most beautiful Martian meteorite for obvious reasons, a beautiful exterior with incredible fusion crust. And again, buzzword, fusion crust is a very important thing 
for collectors to see. And the duality of the interior of this piece with a gold, gorgeous blend of color, this peridot type, peridot being the green, you know, it's just a phenomenally wonderfully looking piece. I mean, this is again, the main mass or the large and largest extant known example of the total known weight of this particular meteorite. And these Martian meteorites typically are termed NWA for people who don't know, that stands for Northwest Africa, where most of these have been recovered and they all have a number and the number is sort of the, the sequential number of the find. So like NWA 1950 is the name of this and the Chassig night before is technically NWA 2737. And that'll all tie into the meteoritical bulletin, which gives you all the information. Again, this piece is also featured on the NASA website. And this is really so special. I can't underscore how rare and how incredible this is. I mean, you're, you are going to have a, a meteorite that is one of the most important Martian examples that exists on this planet. So I'm curious, you know, look, you and I talked at great length last year about this lunar meteorite. Uh, yep. I was excited to write about it. It's sort of yep. like I said, one of the reasons I came here. You know, who who winds up buying something like this? And, and, and I, you know, I'm, I'm just sort of curious in terms of where they wind up. Um, and again, you know, has that nature of that collector changed? Did, did, were people buying meteorites last year who were not buying them two, three, four years prior? Well, let, let me let me say this. And again, I'm not being vague, but obviously I only know certain amounts of information and heritage you know, to make sure everyone understands, we have a, a great deal of confidentiality for Absolutely. our clients and our consigners. But I will say, and, and this, I, I think this is an enlightening kind of kind of comment. The same person bought both the large lunar and the large Martian in the sale last time. And wow. it's not a person who I was familiar with in terms of saying, oh, that's a, that's a noted collector or that's somebody who does that. I feel like it might be somebody who simply said, you know, I'm coming across this. Maybe they were looking at the sale for something else. And they said, are you freaking kidding me? I can have, you know, basically a, you know, a, a, a five or six pound piece of the moon and a six or seven pound piece of Mars. I mean, again, Robert, I, I hate to get so sounding so casual and so unprofessional, but that's incredibly awesome. I mean, again, a six pound piece of the moon, a seven pound piece of Mars. What, what, what else do I need to say? <laughs> it's unbelievable. You know, Craig, I've done a lot of these uh, market commentaries and previews with folks. Uh, very few have the uh, profound and robust enthusiasm you do, and for which I'm eminently grateful, sir. Well, I, I, I hope it is. Again, like I said I, I, my, my inner child is, is just, you know, is, is at, at full tilt every day here. And this is something that, like every kid, I picked up rocks and stuff like anybody else. <clears throat> I was very close to my maternal grandfather. When I was nine years old, he literally gave me a book and a rock piece of purple fluorite. He signed it to me. And years later, and this is the feel good moment for, for today, I went to my first major gem and mineral show in Denver, Colorado, ran into the author, had the book, and he signed it back to me with appreciation to my grandfather. So when my place is burning down, what do you think I'm grabbing on the way out the door? So I have this thing that has followed me for decades of my life and drew me to this place. And when I, you know, when I came to Heritage of almost 10 years ago to do this for them, it really was the culmination of, of a life's dream and also kind of a, you know, sort of a little bit of a divine direction. I, I am, I'm sort of called to do this, I think. It's a crazy thing, but I am so fortunate to be in the right place, as you can see by my dinosaur behind me and my dinosaur coffee mug. I'm, I'm in it to win it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love this. Uh, speaking of meteorites, I think this is uh, also from this upcoming sale, this uh, Brenham meteorite as well. This is, a, this is a crazy, crazy story, and it, it has all kinds of ties. It's beautiful. This is a big flight-oriented fragment of the Brenham meteorite that was found in Kansas. You can see kind of it's pointed almost like the cone top of a rocket or uh, an airplane would be um, this particular fragment. I, I hate to use the term fragment because it weighs 320 pounds. Okay. It's a, a heck of a fragment. Okay. But there's a couple of very, very important things, Robert. And I would love to, to share this with everybody. First of all, this particular specimen has been on display at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History. 
So I, people might throw away the term museum quality a lot of times to speak about natural history specimens. This has been in a museum, in a museum that both you and I are very familiar with. That's very important. Secondly, and this I find really impressive to anybody, if you look up the Wikipedia entry for the Brenham meteorite, under specimens, the first photograph is of this piece. So this piece is photographed on the Wikipedia page for this particular meteorite, okay? I mean, the, it is very important for Kansas. And the, and the beautiful thing is this was found by a noted meteorite, well, adventurer meteorite hunter named Steve Arnold, who some people will know has partnered with my good friend, Jeff Notkin for the Meteorite Men Show. And this was also co-discovered by Fort Worth geologist, Phil Manny, who is also a good friend of ours. And, you know, he was instrumental in having it on display, does a lot with the Monig Meteorite Institute over at Texas Christian University or TCU as we know it here locally. So this is an extremely important meteorite with a great local tie that has everything going for it. I mean, this is just, this is huge. This is important. This is American. This has been in a museum. This is featured on the Wikipedia page. I mean, again, I can't underscore enough how excited and proud I am to have these things in the catalog and be able to offer them to the public. I mean, these really are incomparable pieces, and I hope they get the, uh, the attention they deserve. Have you ever sold a Wikipedia entry before? I don't think so. I mean, I'm sure some of the stuff could be up there. And as I said, the two Martian meteorites in this sale are featured on the NASA webpage, which also makes them quite significant. The Wikipedia thing I thought was kind of funny. I'm I'm a little more interested that it was in the Fort Worth Museum. But, you know, this day and age, Wikipedia means so much to so many people. It kind of gets you instant credibility. There you go. <laughs> You know, I wanted to go back to this uh, crystallized, uh, sure. I know we had this crystallized gold here as well. Uh, mm -hmm. This is uh, fr uh, from uh, October. Yep. And uh, also then uh, this. Uh, Rotocrosite. This Rotocrosite. I, I didn't want to pronounce it correctly. <laughs> um, but certainly, you know, when I, when I, for years when I thought of this category, I thought of Rotocrosite. I thought of uh, fluorocyte, uh, fluorite. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've thought of, you know, obviously the crystals have been a very big part of this category for a very yes. long time. Yes. So, you know, talk to me a little bit about what that marketplace has been like in the last year. You know, I, I seem to see that um, many of the uh, Zoom calls I'm on, uh, I always uh, see several of these behind folks. It seems to be um, the decoration of choice, if not a bookshelf behind them. Yep. Well, I'll, I'll go. I want to go back and I, I want to elongate your, your perspective on this. Um, probably about 20 to 30 years ago, the mineral collecting hobby really took off. And things have gotten in the mineral side, pulling numbers that are amazing. I mean, I think the, I think the most expensive mineral specimen we've sold here at Heritage realized $662,500. I mean, you know, for, for basically a, a decorative rock that goes in a case, that's pretty impressive. Okay. I mean, if you think about it in those terms, right. so I think there is, and, and there's a couple reasons here that the mineral business does minerals do have an inherent decorative appeal that some people, not me, but that other people will argue fossils and meteorites don't really have. Okay. We're in the, the world of blacks and browns and fossils and meteorites where the minerals have colors galore. And of course, minerals are the raw materials of what's faceted into gemstones, which of course is a whole different kind of thing. You get into jewelry and what people really enjoy. This stuff, ironically, the first gem, major gem and mineral show I went to in Denver, Colorado, was where this rhodochrosite material was introduced because it had recently been mined. This particular rhodochrosite, not surprisingly, is now the state mineral of Colorado for obvious reasons, it's so associated with it. The beautiful color, the, 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 the rhombohedral cleavage or what we call the shape of the actual crystal, the associations or the other minerals with it, you can see there it's got purple fluoride on the back, it's got golden pyrite or what a lot of people refer to as fool's gold, it's got white quartz, it'll sometimes have other silver metallics called tetrahedrite, sphalerite. This is just an exquisite Particular piece. The one we're offering now is one of the largest actual individual crystals to have come out of the pocket. I mean, this is a, a bar none 
collector mineral of a highly, highly coveted species. Um, I would argue Colorado rhodochrosite is one of the most collectible specimens. It's an iconic locality. And unless someone collects for a specific specialty, I can't think of any major mineral collection in the world that does not have a representation of this type of material. So who is this major collector? Is it somebody for whom the decoration is the main goal? Is it someone for whom the, you know, the history of the piece, the, the, as you say, the, whether it's the state rock of a, or of a particular, uh, you know, right. locale. Well, I mean, really what, you know, what is the, when you saw this market, take off 20 years right. ago right. Um, to what did you ascribe its immediate success? When, when people saw this come out, even, even the hard, the hardest core mineral person realized that there was something special here. The, the, the form, the color, everything they do, people were investing in this. I literally, and I'm not exaggerating, knew people who were buying rhodochrosites, putting them in the safe deposit box and saying they were going to pay for their kids' college. That was literally a phenomenon that, that I, I'm not making up. And I wish, rather than making fun of those people at the time, I wish I had, had the wherewithal, although I don't think my budget at the time would have done it. Um, I actually now own a couple of, of, of quite impressive rotocrosites, but I sure didn't back in the day. But I, I think, you know, to tie that into your question about over the past year, I think people are continuing to look at these the, some of the specimens we're looking at, like this is a, a water clear green fluorite. And the picture can't possibly even do it justice, no matter how good our photography is. On these particular museum quality specimens, it's, it's serious collectors. They're looking for clarity. They're looking for crystal form. They're wanting to know the, the particular location, possibly even the mine. All these things are very, very important to collectors. Fluorite is a very popular mineral, comes in a variety of colors, so you can make a huge collection of nothing but fluorite. Some people do that. In those cases, that's really the case. There are plenty of decorative minerals, but to really answer your specific question, the person who's buying a high-end sweet home, which is the mine, the sweet home mine in Alma, Colorado, buying a sweet home roto is not buying it for decorative appeal other than how great it looks in their case, but they're buying it because they are a significant mineral collector. And I will say, I mean, good quality sweet home rhodochrosites are, are easily into the five and six figures. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a commitment. This is not a, you know, this is not a weekend warrior rock collection here. This is some, some serious, serious stuff. So an, uh, an attendee on our Q and a, and again, if you have a question for, if you have a question, <laughs> for Craig, uh, feel free to drop it into the Q and a. Uh, there is Absolutely. one that has been left for you. And in fact, I think it's a very good uh, transition to the next okay. few items we're going to discuss. Okay. First of all, thank you for saying that this is a wonderful presentation. That's all because Craig is doing an extraordinary job. Oh, God. Well, th thank you. I'm just, uh, <laughs> I do appreciate that. Whoever, it's a great comment. Uh, the uh, This anonymous attendee, who I assume is not related to you, says, are there any legal issues with the export or sale of these minerals that collectors should be aware of? The discussion of the moon rock legalities got me curious. And that's probably a very interesting transition into some of the fossils and uh, things yes. we're going to discuss here. It's it's an absolutely great thing at at the moment. And again, we want to be careful. You know, we we don't dispense legal advice or anything, of course. And I will say that for the most part, minerals are really not an issue. I mean, with anything that's being collected, obviously, um, ownership and um, you know, access and license are all important. So obviously most, most minerals are, you know, are come from mines under the ground. Okay. So they're mined out of something. So it's not, you're not going to be walking along, you know, a path in a, you know, in a national park in Colorado and find a rhodochrosite laying there. That's not going to happen. So it kind of takes it out of there. But the question is a wonderful question. If I can twist it, the fossils. Fossils very much have that issue. There are many countries that restrict the exportation of fossils, and the United States government will often reciprocate those particular um, prohibitions. Um, there's my light again. Hold on. Well, just another to a good point. Um, so basically, there are places like, for example, right now, and people have heard about it a lot, 
um, vertebrate fossils from China are now deemed illegal. So dinosaurs from China are illegal to offer and sell. Um, everybody knows about various people, including some celebrities that have issues about this kind of stuff. So the legal issues are very important. Again, in my role as president of AAPS, we watch that very, very closely. And, a, and an incredible example that Robert so so perfectly, maybe even accidentally pointed up for me, right? There's this mammoth tusk. Mammoth mammoths are obviously they are they are not modern elephants. They they live during the ice age or what geologically is known as the Pleistocene. And these particular so this is fossilized ivory. This is not elephant ivory. However, even fossilized ivory is illegal in nine U.S. states. So we even have to put a disclaimer in our catalog that if you live in, unfortunately, places like New York and California, you actually can't make a bid on this piece because we can't send it to you in that state. So it really becomes a bit of a challenge. Now, from the, from the standpoint of some people, they find that a little bit foolish, but the argument would be that sometimes people will try to pass off elephant ivory as fossilized ivory to you know contribute to the problems with the elephant ivory um, debacle in that trade, which is problematic to be sure, but it, it seems a little bit of a penalty to, to cause it with these kind of fossils. But absolutely legal issues are in there. There are a lot more. As Robert said at the beginning, the challenges for someone in my role is that something that maybe was legal 10 years ago maybe isn't legal now. The laws are constantly changing. As with anything legal, it can almost come down to interpretation. Um, you know, what the government decides to deem illegal, guess what, is probably going to be illegal. And you probably really don't want to be on the other end of that fighting fighting Uncle Sam. So, But for this particular case, this tusk came from Alaska, which is known for some very, very high quality. The reason this is spectacular has a couple of things. First of all, it's virtually complete with only some minimal restoration on the tip. It's got incredible color. The blue color is the most highly prized in these tusks, and it's created when the mineral vivianite is part of the replacement process. So again, we know this is not a contemporary elephant tusk because it's not white, and it's got this beautiful color of fossilization, not only the, the tan and taupe patinas, but this blue color. It's very thick. It's got a nice curve. It's an outstanding size. I mean, there is just, this is truly one of the finest mammoth tusk that I have seen or handled in doing this for about 25 years. This is an unbelievable specimen with immense decorative potential as well. And in this case, the uh, owner of the tusk made this beautiful custom metallic or uh, metal post stand, which allows it to kind of float. A lot of times these are cradled in little kind of wooden sort of holders that that are a functional, but they're not particularly decorative. This gives you the vertical orientation that makes this look good. And as Robert showed with the the other picture with the model, you get an idea of really how sizable this piece is as well. I mean, you know, that that is a, a full-size, beautiful human being, and that is a big, big mammoth bus. And this is so, I, again, I, I sound like I'm overselling, but I can't, I can't overstate how superlative this particular example is. You know, I wanted to get to a, a few of these other pieces before we get yes. to the skeleton as well, uh, as we discuss these tusks. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I'm fascinated by um, where these come from and where these wind up. Yep. You know, this is a, certainly an extraordinary specimen. In fact, uh, there, are, there are several of them as we uh, go through the yep. course of the, the last few minutes here. Absolutely. Um, talk to me a little bit about these in terms of who collects them and has that collector changed over the last few years? Sure, sure. Well, I, I, I want to go back further again because I can't I can't stop with the mind vitamins because you're giving me just too many good softballs. And as you know, we've played softball together. There's all these great tie-ins. Is is just this this is a mosasaur. And again, a couple important things. It's not a dinosaur. And one thing that a lot of people don't know, and even some textbooks will get wrong, dinosaurs belong to two particular reptilian orders the Saurischians or the lizard hips and the Ornithischians or the bird hip. Anything that, that lived in the water or flew in the air was not a dinosaur. Now these lived at the same time as the dinosaurs, especially during the late Cretaceous when the dinosaurs were most prolific, but I wanna be careful with people that ichthyosaurs, which we'll see later, plesiosaurs, which are what people think the Loch Ness monster would be, and these mosasaurs, which actually are found in Texas, by the way, 
Um, there's one in the Perot Museum, and they found them all over the place here. This particular one, second mind vitamin, is that this came from what was called the, the Great Western Interior Seaway. There was a huge body of water some 80 plus million years ago that effectively bisected the North American continent. And these incredible oceans were filled with this kind of guy who was one of the apex predators of that particular um, ecosystem. This guy, if you were to stretch him out, would be 18 feet, six inches long. So we're kind of lucky he's curled up. Even on that, that um, rock that he's on there, he's still 12 feet, 12 feet wide by seven feet long, as you can see by the picture with the kids. This was one of the pictures of it out there. Mosasaurs were, you know, just obviously big, big marine lizards that were, uh, you know, pretty, pretty ferocious, as you can see. And of course, you know, what kid doesn't love a big sea monster? So we've got that right there. This is actually this particular um, variety of Mosasaur, uh, Mosasaur is now considered the state marine fossil of Kansas. So one of these is actually hanging in the governor's mansion in Kansas. So I think that's kind of, I love all these little secondary facts too, but this, this is an exquisite specimen. It's got minimal re restoration. Obviously the bones were taken out of the situ context and prepared and put back sort of in a, in a little bit decorative idea, but the fossil itself is quite complete and quite spectacular. Perfect segue, Robert. The ichthyosaur. This guy is 11 feet long, and I'm talking about the fossil, not just the rock. This is from the Holzmaden Lagerstadt in Germany. A Lagerstadt is a iconic locality known for producing a prolific amount of species with above average, if not exceptional, preservation. So the beautiful shales of these German places, and in addition to Holzmaden, there's there's Messel, there's Bundenbach, there's a couple other places, and there's Solnhofen, which has a different colored tan limestone akin to our Green River Lagerstadt, where all the fossil fish come from in, in the Western United States. The preservation of this is exquisite. You can see stomach contents. Robert couldn't be doing this better. He's clicking on the dark mass in the gullet there, which is stomach, preserved stomach contents. Um, this is just absolutely exceptional. An ichthyosaur, again, is a rep reptilian non-dinosaur, probably actually, though, a bit more like a modern-day porpoise. If you actually look at it, you can see that in, in the shape and especially the skull. These pieces were out of a collection, and they were prepared um, a longer time ago. These probably go back 20 or 30 years, so the, the restoration techniques were not as consistent with contemporary things where they make everything look perfect. But I particularly as a purist love this because this really has a rustic nature and it really looks all fossil. There's nothing wrong with the decorative appeal of this, but obviously every little imperfection of the natural fossil has not been, you know, worked out. And you can also see these beautiful ribbed shell imprints of ammonites, which is, uh, you know, was a a popular invertebrate. Again, mine vitamin number four is that all the ammonites went extinct at the same time that the dinosaurs went extinct in the big KT boundary extinction at the end of the Cretaceous some 65 or 66 million years ago. So there's so many little corollaries, so many backstories on this piece, the beautiful irregular shale matrix. I mean, again, you can see some of the lines through the actual pieces when it was quarried out. But I mean, this is pretty much, you know, th this really gives you a snapshot to what the fossil should look like. You know, this is just, this is, again, I can't understate the term a museum piece for size, for quality, for significance from the famed Holzmaden Lagerstadt locality of Germany, where a lot of stuff probably isn't going to be produced forever. This is a, this is really a one of a kind museum quality specimen that I, you know, again, for the value it's actually very, very reasonably valued. Craig, I'm curious, do people purchase these for display in their homes or are these actually, do we often sell these to museums? Well, unfortunately, in many, many cases, people ask me that a lot and museums really don't have the funding to do it. The perfect model is that a donor will buy something and give it to a museum. That's, that's a much better um, kind of situation there. 
But in this case, I, you know, this is a certainly a museum quality piece, a museum mount could end up in an institution. Sometimes it does. A lot of people will collect and their children or grandchildren really don't have an interest. So they'll get bequeathed to an institution or whatever. I do think these could go both ways. Maybe not a residential home per se, but I mean, some people have, um, you know, they'll, the, the CEO of an oil company will say, this would be incredible in our boardroom or this needs to be the entryway to our office building. And I don't know how anyone could disagree with this. And the story behind it, especially the fact that it's real and natural and singular. This isn't, this isn't a piece of art created by a human. This isn't something that can be replicated. This represents an organism that lived, you know, nearly a hundred million years ago. I mean, again, how uh, do I need to blow my mind anymore? Yours or anybody uh, else's? Right. It's absolutely fabulous. The other one you just showed before Let me is a quick. rather rare crocodilian or a crocodiliform. This guy is 10 feet long. And this Stenosaurus is, is just unbelievable. Probably had a pescatarian diet, meaning it lived on fish. You can see it's got beautifully well-preserved pointed, pointed teeth in the snout for doing that. You can sort of see that it's a, you know, a little bit more of a crocodilian than an alligator type form. I mean, it's just, it's just exquisite. The preservation is great. You can see the raised vertebral column. You can really see the uh, the texture on the scutes or the little scale type preservation there. And again, our, our model Sabrina giving you an idea of just how significant this big piece is. I mean, this is, this is a 10 foot long fossil in great condition. These are absolutely exquisite. I mean, I guess because I've been doing this a little bit longer, even professionally than I was with Heritage, but at some point, I, I think we all come to the amazement of a realization that these things are actually available and can be purchased and owned by private citizens. It's, it's amazing. I think that's the thing that blew my mind when I got here. It's, I thought these things just basically stayed yep. in the museums for forever. Yep. yep. It's crazy. Uh, the reason I went back to the uh, woolly mammoth tusk real quick, yes, sir. Is, uh, there's a question. Uh, somebody asked in the Q&A, is there a chance the Vivianite in the tusk will alter or decompose? I have not had that experience, and I have never heard that as a concern or a reality. Uh, there certainly are some things where, you know, I mean, if this was displayed in your home in front of a window where you had incredible direct sunlight, you know, over years and years and years, is it possible? But I mean, that could be some degradation just in the, the polishing compound or any kind of sealant that was used in the preparation. I don't know that the Vivianite itself would actually decompose in terms of the visible hue, but I really, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I would say that's going to take more research. I don't know offhand. I don't think it's a problem, but that's a wonderful thing that even I'm going to research when we're finished with this. And speaking of that, because there's another question, uh, if you have a question for Craig and want to follow up with that, Craig, give folks your email address. Uh, my Very easy. It's my first name, Craig, just C-R-A-I-G, then the letter K at H-A.com. Uh, tongue in cheek, it actually is really just looks like Craig K at ha.com. That's all you got to do to get right to me. And I will happily address your question, research it. And if I don't know the answer, I'll find it for you. And fortunately, I, as I said, through my position with the apps and what I've been doing at Heritage, I know many, many people in all of these businesses who are much smarter than I and will absolutely get you the answer that you need. Craig is good for uh, if you have a question about a consignment, something you have that probably would be specific to the nature and science category. Absolutely. That's what Craig is there for. Absolutely. They answer questions about upcoming auctions. Yep. And uh, Craig, somebody asks here, and I'm sure other people may have the question, can I obtain catalogs from prior natural history auctions from Heritage? Um, email Craig and he'll still have somebody send you what he's got. Yeah, we, we, we do have extra copies of some. Others are harder to get. You know, we don't always do a printed catalog for anything. But one of the beautiful things is that Heritage's full archives are online, as Robert well knows. And we often have, especially even for this upcoming sale, a what we call the printed version of the catalog online, where you can literally flip through it electronically, just as though you're reading it on, you know, printed pages in front of you. So we're always happy to try to... Uh, satisfy any request subject to what our availability might be. 
And one thing I always recommend to folks is that you can browse the online catalog by many different ways. What's first Absolutely. in the auction, what's the highest price, what's the most active, um, kind of any way you want to look at it. You know, this is, you'll know here, this is the first auction. This is the first item in the live auction when it begins at seven o'clock on central time on Friday. Yep. Uh, a couple of last ones I know you wanted to look at. This is one of my favorite pieces in the upcoming yeah. auction. Yeah, this this is a uh, this is a beautiful uh, gem ammonite, and we say that for a couple of reasons. This this is obviously an ammonite. You know, as we talked about, were the invertebrate you know shelled creatures that lived at the same time of the dinosaurs. This particular type of fossilization with this incredible color pigmentation is only is roughly only found in a singular locality on the north slope of the Rocky Mountains, typically concentrated around um, Alberta and Calgary, Canada. The, the, since 1981, the World Jewelry Confederation has deemed the material, which they call amylite, kind of off the root of an ammonite, which is the fossil shell, to be a gemstone. So this is actually both fossil and gemstone. They will take pieces of this material and make jewelry, which you'll even see sometimes offered in our weekly natural history auctions that are online and close every Thursday each week. Uh, this is a beautiful piece in, in matrix. Matrix refers to when a specimen is actually in a background rock. So this gorgeous, colorful ammonite is in this beautiful black shale. Beautiful thing of this piece is it's, it's designed to be a wall hanging. There's actually a permanent French cleat system on the back of it. So you actually can easily and securely, as long as you've got the weight bearing capacity, put it on your wall. And this is an example where you know, this has got it all. This is a museum quality specimen. It's got even the more, more rare blues and purples. Colors are often red, gold, and green, but blues and purples are very uncommon. It's got great size. I think this ammonite, the ammonite alone is like 16 or 18 inches across. The, uh, the matrix piece really gives it context to how it was found. The contrast, it's very decorative. It can be installed in a wall but it's collectible. So it's museum quality, collectible specimen, decorative application. It's got it all going for it. These have become very, very popular in recent years because again, a lot of people consider these ammonites to be very feng shui, which is certainly important for the design element. And something that I love going back to, I guess it was Da Vinci, maybe the, the golden ratio of natural inherent perfection and beauty is theoretically seen in the spiral nature of an ammonite. So if you actually look at it now, obviously these have been compressed and altered through the fossilization process, but an ammonite as a natural form, if you can see the one behind me here, whatever, do represent that golden ratio. I mean, these, again, it's just, it's limitless to how much fun you can have if you kind of want to geek or nerd out on this stuff as I obviously do every day. So it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. I could go on forever, but I know we got to, we got to keep focused and I know people want to go enjoy the rest of their day. Well, we're going to wrap it up with this last piece that I know you wanted to discuss that's yep. in this particular, in the upcoming yep. auction on Friday. Yeah. This, this is a great segue. And Robert, I don't, you, you, you're inside my head because you're, you're, I couldn't be moving this cursor better than you are. It's amazing. This is a, this is an exquisite for a number of reasons. The, the, the fossil material represented here is a crinoid. A crinoid is going to be akin to what people would think of as a sea lily today, but I guess taxonomically, it's actually more like an animal. You know, people always talk about plants and animals. There's actually five kingdoms, so there's a lot going on here. This particular piece is, is an inlaid specimen, and sometimes that will happen for an artistic standpoint. The fossils are real, the background rock comes from the unappropriate place, but it's put in this as a decorative artistic thing. This is one of only a handful of pieces done in this particular way, probably the arguably the best example of it. This beautiful crinoid is well-preserved. It also has the advantage of being pyritized. We talked about the mineral pyrite being fool's gold. So here the replacement element of mineralization was actually a metallic. So you have this silvery gold sheen to this piece that makes it absolutely striking. It's so contemporary with the black and silver. It's spectacular. The, 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 the way that sort of the brush tones on the back, 
the beautiful, um, naturally irregular beveled nature of the rock. This particular crinoid, there's a second one down here. These are two different species. They may not have occurred together just like this, but that's really not the point. The one is, is what they call a pelagic creature. So it would attach a piece of driftwood like this and float around as opposed to being anchored to the ocean floor. Like we talked about, the crinoids are, are very, very varied and combats too much. A very with an E and a very with an A, uh, sort of complicated group that have a whole lot of different varieties. So this really is a highly, highly decorative example, but it's got an incredible fossil story behind it. I mean, you can simply see that there's there's no question how beautiful this would look as the centerpiece in any room in any home. It's actually got a grooved back, so it's designed to attach right to a wall. Very thick and heavy, but exquisitely beautiful. I mean, these are you know, if I, I'll recap for me before you do it for us is basically, I'm very proud of this, what I call a boutique sale. Uh, these are all curated specimens that were brought together to try to really put what I would say are the best of the best examples. It's a small auction because everything in it's important and everything's there for a reason. If I didn't think that something was one of the best examples, I wouldn't have chosen it for this. So this is a very special, very rare opportunity to acquire some of what I would say are just absolutely phenomenal representations of the varieties. Look, I mean, I, I think about all the things we didn't talk about. This cave bear uh, skeleton, <laughs> yeah. for instance, is utterly yep. fascinating i mean this is um there are just 50 lots so it'll be a lot of fun uh, i always okay. recommend folks uh, who uh, have not watched the heritage heritage auction uh now that we've improved our heritage auction um actually uh, our presentations are really terrific with nice videos yep. uh terrific uh it's a nice tv show to watch and the fact is that this is a good education and i have to say craig this has been a thorough delight um to to get to talk to you about what is upcoming and what we've sold in the state of the market. Um, this has really been one of my favorite ones. So I can't. Well, no, I appreciate that. And, you know, I'm, I'm obviously biased because, you know, people don't know you and I are friends besides doing this, but that's, that's just an added bonus. Um, yeah, I will say you brought, you've got a great reminder. Just my last sort of um, comment in there is that many of these pieces actually do have a video that might either be a 360 spin that my photographer did or a stand-up video where I'm talking about this stuff. I did that with the ichthyosaur, the crocodile, and the two Martian meteorites. So you can find videos down there on the carousel. You can do whatever, you know, we're all over the place and, uh, you know, whatever we can do to help. And please don't, you know, if anybody here, honestly, I like to, I take this very personally, as you can tell, reach out to me uh, in advance of the sale. I'll answer any questions. We'll get a condition report out to you. We'll do whatever we can. We'd love you to participate. And just you know, take one of these beautiful, life-changing specimens home. Well, this has been a real pleasure. Remind folks how to get a hold of you. Uh, your email address, and if you my like my email address is Craig Craig K at ha dot com. That's the best way to reach me, or you can call me at two one four four zero nine nineteen ninety five. And then, of course, this auction can be seen at you know www dot ha dot com slash eight zero three six. And as Robert said, it'll be our Platinum Night offering at 7 p.m. Central on Friday, March 19th. So we're getting very excited. We're going to have a lot of fun on Friday night. So please, uh, please join us. Craig, always a pleasure, sir. Thank you very much. Good luck and good luck to everybody who's participating. And if you uh, have something that uh, you'd like Craig to uh, take a look at, reach out to him as well. Uh, I can't wait to do this again. And I, I can't wait to see you Friday night, sir. Thank you. No, very much. Th thank you, my friend. We'll do it soon. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.